The Battle of Leignitz is a fantastic battle to look at if you've ever asked yourself, well, how did European knights and cavalry fare versus Mongolian horse archers? But it's also a great battle to look at if you want to compare the high level of military sophistication with which the Mongols operated with on the battlefield relative to their European counterparts. And at this battle, the tactic that the Mongols are going to so excellently display is known as the feigned flight. Not a tactic that they made or invented, it had been around since ancient Greece, ancient Syria, but they were masters of it. They perfected the feigned flight. And it's exactly like what it sounds. What would happen is, uh, during the battle, the Mongols would pretend to be overwhelmed. They'd pretend to be scared. They'd pretend as if their lines had broken and that they were running away. This would coax the enemy into chasing them and into leaving the safety of their own lines. Once they had been separated as such, the Mongols could then easily give the signal to flank and crush the enemy. The reason this feigned flight worked so well is it played on the battlefield expectations of the European knight and the European cavalry. You see, what they were so good at was giving chase during battles and slaughtering the enemy whilst they ran. That's what they were experts at and that's what the Mongols played, at, played on at this battle so well. Now, they're going to execute this feigned flight in three separate steps. The first is separate, the second is isolate, and the final one is flank or overwhelm. But before we talk about these three steps and how they execute this feigned flight at this battle, let's first give some context to what's happening here. Why are these two sides fighting? Ogadai Khan, the son of Chinggis Khan, had sent a large force into Hungary in order to crush King Bela IV and the Cumans. However, at the same time, he doesn't want that force in Hungary to get flanked by the Poles, right? By the Polish forces. So he has sent a smaller army, a smaller detachment into Poland to crush any forces that may be coalescing. Now, the Polish side at this battle is led by Henry the Pious, Henry, the Duke of Silesia, and at this battle he's managed to gather around eight to 9,000 men. On the sides here he has infantry, very ill-equipped and very ill-disciplined infantry. They're supposedly miners and peasants, not a very strong force. However, in the center here he has his knights, a mix of Polish, Bavarian, and mercenaries. It is even said, according to some sources, that there were some Teutonic knights at this battle. Now, let's talk about the Mongol forces. The Mongol forces were an entirely mobile army, entirely mounted, consisting mainly of horse archers. However, there are definitely some uh, heavy cavalry, cavalry amongst their ranks. Now, before we begin talking about the battle, it's important to note that at some point before the battle had begun, the Mongolian commander would find the highest area of ground and by placing himself on that elevated terrain, he, using a system of flags and banners, could give commands for the army to act, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, let's jump straight into what happens. At the start of the battle, the Polish Duke sends out his first line just to see what the Mongol reaction is going to be, and they are met by the Mongolian vanguard. Now, supposedly, this vanguard of Mongols is pushed back initially, okay? However, they are then surrounded by the Mongolian horse archers and picked off. And it is here that you can see and discuss why the Polish or why the European cavalry was so ineffective against the mounted archer. You see, the cavalry was armed with a lance and a sword, all close combat weapons, all required the knight to get into melee range to strike the fatal blow in order to deal damage to his opponent. But the problem is he's chasing a horse archer who is so well trained with his horse, who is such an expert at keeping his distance from, from the European knight and at the same time, he, is, he has these fantastic leg muscles that grip onto his horse and these fantastic core muscles that allow him to turn around and whilst being chased, fire arrows at the European knight, okay? So this first line, this first uh, uh, detachment that the Duke had sent is picked off. They are either killed or run away. However, the initial success must have enticed the Duke to send his second line. And it is at the second line that the Mongols spring their trap. Because once the second line advances, the Mongols pretend like it's too overwhelming, it's too strong. Ah, you know, they, 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 they spring this faint flight and they begin to run. In doing so, in doing so, they entice 
the European cavalry to charge, and it, 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 it forces the Duke, the Duke of Poland to send the rest of his men in. Remember we said that the knights were so good at, at, at dealing these decisive blows whilst the enemy were running. But they've fallen right into the trap that the Mongols have laid, because as you can see, a distance here has been created between the cavalry and the rest of the men, okay? And the first goal of the Mongols has been executed at this battle, separate, okay? Now, this distance here, once it's been created, and once they're thoroughly isolated, once they're tired from running all this distance, remember we said there's the Mongol commander that gives the signal? Because at this point, a signal was given for smoke to be deployed on the battlefield, across this field that the knights had just walked across. And here the Mongols are executing the second part of the plan, which is isolate. What this smoke does is it acts as a screen between this cavalry force and the rest of the Polish forces, okay? The Duke here doesn't know what's happening. He can't see what's going on. He doesn't know, should I retreat or should I send in the rest of my men? I he, he is completely in the dark. Not only that, according to Chronicles, the smoke is nauseating. It is disorienting and it blows into the night. And at this point of the battle, it's pretty much over because all that's left to do is for the Mongolian commander atop, atop his elevated terrain to give the signal to these mounted horse archers on the flank to surround and crush these knights. That mind you are unable, are unable to get into striking distance of the Mongolian archers, right? They, they simply can't get into melee range. The Mongolians so expertly, so, so great at keeping their distance from the knight. Once these are picked off, the battle is over. The peasants and miners are no match for the Mongolian horse archers and the Mongolian cavalry, and they are executed to a man. The Duke is said to have been beheaded, and the Mongols are said to have killed so many men that they fill nine whole sacks, each sack containing the ear of one of these men at this battle. And that's the Battle of, uh, of Leignitz. Um, I hope you guys got to see the advantages of tactical mobility of the horse archer at this battle. Um, if you can like and subscribe, please, that would mean so much to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. Um, if you guys can leave any, uh, any like criticism, any, any uh, comments, good or bad, I always, appreciate it that, I always appreciate that as well, as long as it's constructive, as long as it's helpful. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.